Hello, and welcome back to Early Global Cultures. I'm Professor Amy Young, and today we'll finish out our exploration of early arts and culture with a look at the early Renaissance. But before we begin, I'd like you to think back to the 14th century and ask yourself, what good can come of disaster? When have you experienced disaster, and how did things change because of it? Did any of those changes make life better? And what about societies? How do they react, adapt, improve when faced with disaster? Do our reactions as individuals or as a culture say something about us? When Hurricane Ike came through my neighborhood many years ago, tornadoes were spawned, trees were toppled, and I was without power for two weeks. It could have been worse, but for all intents and purposes, it qualified as a disaster. My progress was halted, my plans were put on hold, and every day felt like camping despite the fact that I had a roof over my head. On the first day, the neighbors all came out to inspect the damage. We helped each other clean up yards, patch homes, remove limbs, clear roads. We gathered outside in the evenings to talk and laugh, and in the morning, my next-door neighbor, James, a huge, lovable teddy bear of a man that I'd barely spent more than a few hours with the whole time I'd known him, he brought out his camp stove and made pancakes and coffee and invited me over for breakfast. Sometimes it was James, and sometimes it was another neighbor, but amid that disaster, I really got to know the people around me. And in that time, I felt a greater sense of community than I had felt in any of the years prior that I'd lived in that neighborhood. Then one day, one of the neighbors rented a generator and started to get back to real life, and then another did, and then another. And we weren't meeting in the mornings anymore, and it kind of made me sad. After that September, though, we were kinder to one another. We had survived something together. We had seen each other in new ways. We gathered more often than we had before. We checked in on each other more often. And I think if I called James today, even though he and I have both moved away, we'd still remember those pancakes fondly. So from disaster, yes, some good can be born. It may even challenge us to be better, to do better. There have actually been studies done on this. Folks have looked at community responses to disaster, and what they tracked is just what I experienced. First, everyone's just trucking along with their own personal normal. Then disaster strikes and takes all of that out. See that big impact tip in the chart? Then there's the response and community cohesion as everyone comes together, reaching never-before-experienced highs. But that fades, and so does the optimism when the honeymoon phase ends. The good news is, at the end of the chart, that slow climb back up to something sustainable, something new, and something that is just a bit better than where the community started. And that, my friends, can be applied to the Middle Ages, too. The 14th century was full of disasters. But when all of those superstructures that had held things together fell apart, they made room for something to be reborn. So the destruction of the 14th century cleared a space for rebirth, or as it's called in French, the Renaissance. Today in early global cultures, we'll work to understand the historical and philosophical context of the early Renaissance, and we'll explore the resurgence of humanism in the era, identifying evidence of homage, optimism, and innovation in some of those early Renaissance artifacts. The Renaissance, or Rinascimento in Italian, was a self-conscious revival of interest in ancient Greek and Roman culture. When the world fell apart, people looked back to those times when they thought it worked best. They sought the confidence and optimism of those eras. And with this came a renewed self-awareness and interest in humanity. We saw the beginnings of this with Dante and Giotto. Humanity had potential, and in the Renaissance, they were looking to highlight not just where humanity had been awesome before, but where it could be awesome again. The folks who were doing this were still very Christian, though, and they found interesting ways to combine their humanist ideas with their Christian beliefs. And most people would agree that this Western movement found its earliest stride in Florence. There are a few reasons why Florence was an ideal location for rebirth. First, there was money in Florence. It was the center of the wool trade, and it was making a name for itself in European banking, too. 
Also, Florentines felt they had a strong classical relation. The Etruscans, that early civilization that set things up for Rome, they came from this region. And despite the tragedy befalling much of Europe, Florence had a strong urban center and an independent cultural identity. They were, after all, a republic, like Rome had once been, and they, unlike their neighbors, were not subject to monarchical whims. Additionally, arts and artisans had status in Florence. Senior guilds had a lot of sway in the city, and as luck would have it, there were tons of talented artists in Florence. In fact, around 70% of the artists we now think of when we think of Renaissance arts were active in Florence at this time. So yeah, really, it's the perfect setup for something interesting to happen, and something interesting does indeed. Here's a map of the area. You'll notice that there are a couple of other republics around, but still a great deal of the territories in the West are controlled by empires, monarchies, or other superpowers. But in addition to the proliferation of artists in the area, Florence had another secret weapon, and that was the de' Medici family. Florence was a republic, but a handful of powerful families held sway in the city, and the de' Medici family was a controlling influence in Florence for nearly 60 years. They sponsored some of the greatest artists and innovations of the era, and they went looking for knowledge, ready to revive the wisdom of the ancient world. Their wealth and curiosity brought glory to the city, but it also brought glory to the de' Medici family name. It all started when Giovanni de' Medici started a bank in the back room of a wool shop. Giovanni rose up from a poor life, and he was an aggressive businessman. His banking scheme garnered him a good deal of influence, and at one point, when a man named La Saracosa wanted to be Pope, Giovanni took a chance and backed his candidacy for the papacy. La Saracosa was a scoundrel, and few people thought he would be elected, but when he defied the odds and became Pope John XXIII, who do you think the church started banking with? That's right, Giovanni had played the odds and come out with a winner. Giovanni's son Cosimo eventually took over the bank and amassed a fortune. He was also the -the behind-the-scenes controller of the Council of Florence, even though he was not an elected member of it, and he continued to collect money for the church. He also expanded his financial reach and influence by opening banks throughout Europe. That's his picture there on the top. Perhaps more interesting, though, was that Cosimo was a patron of the arts. For him, it was part curiosity and part political strategy. He wanted Florence to be the hub of the art world. He wanted it to be seen as the new Rome. And he also had a great personal interest in classical ideas and learning. Cosimo brought in scholars from distant lands to educate him and other Florentines on ancient philosophy and culture, and he collected ancient manuscripts, the bulk of which eventually became the Laurentian Library in Florence. He was so interested in the ideas of antiquity that he even opened a Platonic Academy in Florence, the first since Justinian had shut them all down in the 6th century. Cosimo died in 1464, and while he was remembered well and credited with much advancement in Florence, his sons were not so effective. After a generation of decline and loss of family influence, things started to look up when Cosimo's grandson, Lorenzo, worked to reconstitute the family's power. Lorenzo de' Medici's nickname was Il Magnifico, or The Magnificent, and he was kind of a good-time guy. He's the one on the bottom image. He was a poet and a musician, and he re-established the Medici influence with a couple of shrewd political moves. First, he got the support of Rome, which was a big help, because he married the daughter of a Roman aristocrat. And he also got the support of Florentines when he opened his doors to the masses, offering his help in exchange for whatever they could afford. He called this the Liamici di Liamici Network or the Friends of Friends Network, and for his efforts, the Florentines saw him as a benefactor and a leader. And thanks to his grandfather, Lorenzo also had an interest in classical knowledge and arts. He presided over salons full of artistic and philosophical discussion, and he collected ancient artworks. He was a friend and patron of Botticelli, he sponsored the efforts of Leonardo da Vinci, and he even invited artists into his home to study his collection of ancient works and perfect their craft. One such artist was a young Michelangelo. And while he studied sculpture in Lorenzo's home, he was likely exposed to some of those ideas and influences from antiquity, too. Without a doubt, the the Medici family were one of the catalysts that fueled the spark of rebirth in Florence, and the family remained influential for centuries afterward, too. Here's a quick look at the de' Medici family line. 
there's the family crest with the five orange balls. And when you go to Florence, you'll see this crest scattered throughout the city. The family tree starts with Giovanni there at the top, and you can see his grandson Lorenzo a couple of lines down. And then the line goes on and on for a couple of centuries. But do you see these symbols under some of the figures? Gold crowns and red crowns and flags. Any idea what that's about? The gold crowns are popes and the red crowns are monarchs. So yeah, the de' Medici influence doesn't end here in the 15th century. They've got lots of pull for a very long time. And in addition to the powerful families, there were powerful ideas floating around in this era too. Giovanni Mirandola was a prominent philosopher at this time, and he prided himself on the study of classical ideas. For starters, he'd read the ideas of all the guys we've discussed so far, but he also devoured the continued scholarship that was happening in the Muslim world while the West went dark. All of this study and his fascination with those philosophical ideas resulted in his writing Oration on the Dignity of Man. I mean, even just based on the title, you can tell that things are changing. It's no longer the era of on the misery of the human condition, thank goodness. In this seminal work, Mirandola digs into some old ideas in a new way, basically outlining the defining principles of Christian humanism. The conclusion he comes to is that the great thinkers of antiquity were pretty awesome. They showed us what humans were capable of, and they were onto something with those ideas about arete and human potential. In fact, for Mirandola, they prove that humans are gifted by God to think and create and to generally be awesome. Because of this amazing gift, he asserts, we should strive for achievement and improvement. That, he says, is the best way to show appreciation for God's gifts and improve society. According to Mirandola, humanity is in a unique position, somewhere between the divine and the material world. We are capable of reason and creation in ways that lesser living creatures are not. And while we may never be able to achieve the status of divinity, we should work to get as close to it as we can. And we can see the effects of this marriage of humanism and Christianity in the arts too. In this era, we'll see a continuation and expansion on what started with Dante and Giotto. Religious art respects humanity, values it even. We'll see divine figures with human appeal. They're showing real emotions and they're depicted in realistic settings so we can start to imagine ourselves amongst them. We also see an exploration of secular and classical themes. That fascination with antiquity is celebrated and often those ancient themes are married to Christian themes in the arts. And we generally see a sort of arete in the arts. In the Renaissance, there is invention and innovation, techniques like sfumato, chiaroscuro, linear perspective, and perimetal configuration show off what arts and artists are capable of achieving, and artists adopt individual and distinguishable styles, too. Plus, they're becoming famous. Remember, before now, artists were on the same level as any other craft guild worker, but in the Renaissance, they are valued and celebrated like never before. Overall, the arts are striving to reveal the ideal in the real world. And here, those ideas of perfection that we saw with guys like Plato and Aristotle are reborn. So how does this differ from Pope Innocent's view of humanity? Shoot, how does it differ from any of the Middle Ages ideology on humanity's place in the grand scheme of things? Does it seem arrogant or heretical to you? It did to some people. In fact, Mirandola got in trouble with the church for his oration, and they demanded that he make some revisions or face excommunication. But a good example of these ideas taking shape in real time is seen in the competition to decorate the north doors of the Florence Baptistry. The Florence Merchants Guild wanted to spruce up the old building. It had been around since the Roman Empire, and they invited local artists to submit a single design in the hopes of winning the full commission. The subject of the single design was Abraham's sacrifice of his son Isaac, so all of the artists were meant to depict the scene from the Old Testament where Abraham, devoted and obedient, goes to sacrifice his son, and at the last moment, an angel replaces the boy with a ram, a reward for Abraham's having passed the test. It's a pretty tall order, and what you see here is what two of the more prominent artists came up with. 
One of the designs, however, is demonstrating more of those Christian humanist ideas than the other, and that's the one that won the competition. Can you tell which one it was? Just as a side note, the darkness or lightness of the works was not part of the design. It's how the works have aged, but take a look at them. Is there one that seems to be tipping its hat to ancient Greece or Rome? One that seems to celebrate human potential or strength a little more? One that, like Giotto's work, takes you, the viewer, and your experience into consideration? In the end, Brunelleschi's work is beautiful, and it's certainly better than a lot of folks could muster, but it was Ghiberti's work that won the competition. Can you tell how it's showing off those Christian humanist values? Both panels include the same elements, but Ghiberti's is arranged in a way that our eye naturally travels from left to right down the hillside, taking it all in instead of those Middle Ages registers that Brunelleschi is using. Also, check out the difference in the angels. Ghiberti's looks like it's flying out of space. This is a technique called foreshortening, and it's used to increase spatial realism. Now, look at the differences between the two main figures, Abraham and Isaac, in the two works. Ghiberti's Abraham means business. He's determined, forceful, and intense. He's really showing off the heightened emotion of the moment. And then there are the Isaacs. Notice any differences there? Again, Ghiberti's figure looks stronger and more intense, but perhaps you also notice that he's nude. Yep, he's naked, and we haven't seen nude figures since ancient Greece, so this is definitely a shout-out to antiquity. When Ghiberti won the competition, he created 28 more panels for the north doors of the baptistry, and he spent more than 20 years completing them with the help of his students. The doors are comprised of quatrefoil framed religious scenes, and he did such a good job they commissioned him to decorate the east doors too. The east doors were a little different though. They were made up of large bronze panels, and without the quatrefoil frames, Ghiberti was able to show off his skills with linear perspective and landscape settings. The panels here are framed with small busts and statuettes, and Ghiberti even included a small bust of himself in this artifact. The doors in this image are replicas. The originals are now housed in a museum, but still you can see how large the doors are and how they're quite an attractive element on the old building. Michelangelo thought they were so well done that he dubbed them the gates of paradise, and we can only imagine how they must have gleamed when the sun rose in the city. Also, on the right, you can see how this baptistry stands as a pretty prominent structure itself. And when you go to Florence, you must go to this piazza because right off on the right, there's a great little restaurant called Sasso di Dante that's absolutely worth the trip. Now, when Brunelleschi didn't win the competition, he went off to Rome to pout and look at ancient architecture with his buddy Donatello. Donatello's our first Ninja Turtle, in case you're keeping score. And while he was there, he was inspired by the engineering marble that was the dome of the Pantheon. See, the cathedral in Florence was in need of a makeover, especially where its dome was concerned. And what Brunelleschi came up with was a beautiful marriage of ancient engineering and Middle Ages awe-inspiring heights. Here's what he designed. It took Brunelleschi 18 years to complete this, and his design was so advanced that he even had to invent the tools and mechanisms to bring it to life. What you're seeing here is a high dome without any buttressing, not even flyers, and he was able to accomplish this by creating a dome within a dome. The interior dome was strong and circular like the Pantheon dome, and it supported the exterior dome as it achieved tremendous height. While you're in Florence, and before you go to the restaurant, you should visit the cathedral where you can still climb the narrow passage between the interior and exterior domes to get to the top of the cathedral. If you look closely at this image, you can see the people gathered around the top there looking out over the city. And in this image, you can see how Florence's cathedral, with its dome, along with the baptistry in front of it, are central and distinguished features in the city, showcasing how the city was using old models as a basis for new ways of thinking and creating. Now, the decoration of old buildings wasn't the only early Renaissance art taking shape in Florence. Visual art had a field day in Florence, and much of it was showing off those new Christian humanist ideas. 
In the early Renaissance, Christianity and ancient arts had a baby, and their result was art that showcased balance and order, like we saw in ancient Greece, and it also features both Christian and secular themes, kind of like how in ancient Greece and Rome there was little distinction between public life and religious life. We'll also see that they're still painting divine forms, but now those divine forms look distinctly more relatable and human because with Christian humanism, humanity is capable of approaching divinity. Plus, on top of all of this, there's a surge of arete among artists. That is, artists are striving to be the very best they can be. They're getting famous, and with that, they're afforded more freedom to showcase their own skills and personal styles. And they're also finding lots of ways to innovate and push the limits of mediums and design. We saw a little of that innovation with Ghiberti's use of foreshortening and linear perspective techniques that had to be rediscovered since they were abandoned in the Dark Ages. Furthermore, pyramidal configuration becomes a popular way to balance an artwork, and Contraposto comes back onto the scene to add to that balance, too. Finally, chiaroscuro, or light and dark shading, provide work with realistic modeling, and a technique called sfumato provides realistic texture in a new and creative way. Sfumato, that word is just fun to say, but it means like smoke, and it adds a misty quality to a painting. I'll point it out as well as the other characteristics when we see them in these upcoming works. And we'll begin with Donatello's David. The bronze sculpture is still religious in nature, but Donatello has absolutely put his own spin on it, and perhaps even imbued it with some of his personality too. Donatello was a bit of a diva. It's said that he was temperamental and he smashed creations rather than sell them to unappreciative clients. And his David is a little bit sassy, too. First of all, this David is the first freestanding nude since Roman antiquity, and it was commissioned by Cosimo de' Medici. But apart from that attention to anatomy and the showing off for the perfect human form, what's classical about this one? Did you notice the contraposto? Plus, he's not entirely naked. I mean, he has on a hat that's adorned with laurel leaves, which is a common feature in ancient Rome to symbolize victory. And he also has on Roman boots. And what about his expression? He's just defeated a giant. Does he look stressed out to you? No, he looks almost playful or coy, like the victory took very little effort at all. And that may be a touch of Donatello. Plus, just off the top of the giant's head, there's this feather, and the feather runs up David's leg to, oh, I don't really know where that feather goes. And if you look closely, you can see that Goliath's beard hair is wrapped around David's toe. So there are actually a few sort of tickly, playful elements in this one. Here and elsewhere, artists are showing off their own personalities and the personality of Florence. David actually becomes something of a mascot for Florence, symbolizing the underdog's victory over tyranny. And here we have a fresco by Masaccio. Fresco is a technique where paint is applied to wet plaster, and this piece takes up a full 21 feet of the wall at the Santa Maria Novella Church in Florence. Right away, we can see that this work isn't nearly as crowded as some of those earlier Middle Ages works, and it's depicting the Holy Trinity, so it's still very religious in nature. Can you tell what Masaccio is doing differently, though? How is he innovating or calling back to the classics? Check out the barrel vault in his painting, and the coffered ceiling that looks like the one we saw in the Pantheon. Plus, he's also painted... Ionic and Corinthian columns, and the whole thing is arranged in pyramidal configuration, the figures creating something of a triangle that also has depth moving in and out of space. And with this one, we also have a masterful use of linear perspective. This is where all of the orthogonals or directional lines in the painting converge at a single vanishing point, creating a realistic and relatable depth. Oh, and you may have also noticed that Memento Mori is alive and well, so to speak, but it's a little less grotesque here. At the bottom, you see a skeleton, and beneath him, an inscription reads, I was once what you are, and what I am, you too will be. Another prominent artist in Florence was Sandro Botticelli. 
At the time he was hired by the de' Medici to create this painting, he was relatively unknown, but the family helped him achieve great acclaim in his lifetime. Here, his adoration of the Magi is a marriage of secular and religious themes. He's using pyramidal configuration to create balance, and the rounded Roman arches in the background also call back to antiquity. But who are all of the people in this painting? Do they look like folks who might have been hanging around first century Bethlehem? No, these are Renaissance folks. In fact, this whole thing looks like a who's who of Florentine society at the time. There, kneeling in front of Mary and the baby Jesus, is Cosimo de' Medici. And off to the right, with his shock of black hair and black and red robes, is Lorenzo de' Medici. And what about this dude in the front, the one with the gold robe, checking us out? Any idea who he is? That's Botticelli himself, watching you, watching his work, and making sure that we know he has position in society, too. And he didn't stop here. One of his most famous works, La Primavera, is not a portrait, an icon, or a holy celebration. It's fantasy, and it's absolutely Botticelli showing off his stuff. The painting is about seven feet tall and ten and a half feet wide, so it can't be missed, and even its title, which means springtime, feels like a shout-out to the Renaissance or rebirth of the era. So can you tell what's going on here? Is there anything religious about this? Anything classical? It looks like there might be an angel flying overhead, and the woman in the center could be mistaken for Mary, but there are only hints at religion in this one. In fact, the figure flying overhead is Cupid, and the figure in the center is Venus. The mother and son are presiding over the love fest that is springtime, so really, these are classical mythological themes. If we read the painting from right to left, a zephyr is chasing a nymph, who morphs into the figure of Flora. Then there's Venus, gazing out at us and the whole scene, and to her left are three dancing graces and the god Mercury. You can see the wings on his boots as he's the messenger god, but more importantly, where spring is concerned, he's also associated with weather, and you can see him stirring up some clouds overhead. And all of this points to the prosperity and fertility that was Florence under the de' Medici family. In fact, this painting too was commissioned by the family, and the figures gather in an orange grove, which you may remember is reminiscent of the de' Medici family crest. Now, it's hard to imagine that anyone would be upset with such a flowering of art and culture, but as I mentioned, Christian humanism didn't always strike the best chord with the church, and it certainly didn't appeal to the preacher and reformer Girolamo Savonarola. Savonarola was upset about where Florence was headed, and he placed a great deal of that onus on the de' Medici family and their supporters. Savonarola himself had been a Dominican monk, and he was generally opposed to visual art as it was for him akin to idolatry. In Florence, Savonarella preached against the corruption, sensuality, immorality, and excess of Renaissance culture. He said he was bringing God's prophecy and called for repentance, and he drew enormous crowds. It would seem not everyone in Florence had Renaissance fever, and some folks even feared that God would punish them for turning away from more traditional ways of life. Savonarola inspired a number of converts, and by conjuring the fear of damnation in Florentines, he was able to weaken the de' Medici hold on the city. When Lorenzo de' Medici died, it was Savonarola who had great political sway in Florence. And with him as an advisor, the Republic of Florence became something more of a Christian commonwealth in which God was the sole sovereign and his gospel was the law. At Savonarola's recommendation, there were efforts to suppress the vice and frivolity of the years prior, and at one point it even took the form of full-on destruction. On Savonarola's orders, officials gathered up anything that might be construed as vain or sinful. They collected mirrors, cosmetics, lewd pictures, pagan books, gaming tables, fine dresses, and the works of some authors and artists who were deemed immoral. And then all of these items were gathered up and lit on fire in the Piazza Vecchio in what became known as the Bonfire of the Vanities. 
It's said that Botticelli was so moved by Savonarola's preaching that he even threw some of his own paintings into the blaze. Savonarola's hold on the city was broken, however, when he went a step too far and pissed off the Pope. Pope Alexander VI requested Florence's assistance in political matters, and Savonarola, knowing that Pope Alexander was especially corrupt, declined to participate. Seriously, though, look up Pope Alexander VI. He also goes by Rodrigo Borgia, and it's really, really bad. But the Pope retaliated. He accused Savonarola of lying about his prophecy, and after he was tortured by papal inquisitors, Savonarola confessed that the prophecies were made up. As punishment, he was excommunicated and then executed by hanging. In the end, Savonarola was gone, and so was the golden age of the early Renaissance in Florence. But before we go, there are a couple of other Ninja Turtles that found their start in this era, and then they would go on to become quintessential Renaissance men. They are Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo Buonarroti. Both were polymaths. This means that they were good at pretty much everything they tried to do, and they absolutely showcased the arete that was taking over the arts and artists in the early Renaissance. Leonardo da Vinci was a sculptor, a painter, an inventor, and an engineer. We know a bit about his interest because he left behind notebooks in which he explored mathematics, science, the natural world, and humanity. In his coded writings, he transcribed intricate plans for flying machines and turbines and submarines, elevators, ideal cities, and even ideal human forms. He had a prolific and versatile mind, one that worked to synthesize art and science. In his work, we see a masterful use of sfumato, plus he favored darker colors than the other Ninja Turtles, and his works often feature detailed natural settings and close attention to balance and perspective, all of this reflecting his interest in mathematics, design, and the natural world. Michelangelo was also a painter and a sculptor, but he was a poet and an architect too. He had a volatile and eccentric personality, and it's rumored that he was prone to bouts of moodiness or depression. For instance, there's a story that he fired his assistants when working on the Sistine Chapel ceiling because Raphael was working in the Vatican at the same time, and Michelangelo was concerned that his assistants would betray his plans to Raphael and enable the young artist to steal his style. And his style bore the markers of his interest in personality, too. What is now called Michelangelesque is a style that conveys emotional intensity, and while his figures are often preternaturally muscular, I mean, seriously, even Michelangelo's babies are buff, he still manages to render them with superb linear grace. It's said that when Michelangelo sculpted figures, he believed he was releasing souls from stone, and his style absolutely reveals his commitment to that belief. Incidentally, we have surprisingly few completed works from either of these guys, especially considering how active they were in their time. It seems that Leonardo had a bit of ADD, and he would move on to the next project before completing the one he was working on. And Michelangelo was constantly being called on by powerful people to start new projects, so the popularity of his work kept him too busy to finish much of what he started. Either way, they both remain outstanding examples of Renaissance aims even today. See if you can tell where they're exemplifying the ideas of the era as well as their own interests. Here is Leonardo da Vinci's Madonna of the Rocks. Do you see anything that is distinctly Renaissance about it? Anything distinctly Leonardo about it? It has a religious theme and it highlights Christian humanist ideals, but how? I mean, for instance, how do you even know that it's religious? If I haven't given you the title, would you have any clue? The figures here are Mary, Jesus, the angel Uriel, and baby John the Baptist. And apart from some hand gestures and some mostly hidden angel's wings, they have no halos or other distinctly religious characteristics. So yeah, here we are absolutely seeing divine figures with human appeal. So much human appeal, we can hardly tell they're divine. Additionally, da Vinci has composed this one using pyramidal configuration. The figures and their gestures seem to direct us to each point in that pyramid. So he's definitely pulling in some of those Renaissance artistic strategies and ideas too. 
But what about those things that are specific to Leonardo's style? Can you spot any of those here? There's the use of darker colors and detailed natural setting. And in this one, he's used a bit of sfumato too. Do you see that misty quality of the atmosphere at the back of the painting? That's sfumato. He's layered on thin glaze over thin glaze over thin glaze of oil paint to create that smoky quality and show off what he and the medium are capable of. And here is another more famous da Vinci. The Last Supper depicts the moment where Jesus has just announced that one of his apostles will betray him, and they're all kind of freaking out in disbelief, trying to figure out who would do such a thing. All of this showing off naturalism and human beings behaving like humans, and this one is also a fresco. It was painted in a convent's cafeteria, essentially, so while the devotees are eating, they would see Jesus and his posse eating too, adding to the human appeal of these divine figures. Furthermore, this one incorporates linear perspective really well. All of the orthogonals in the painting meeting at a vanishing point just over Jesus' head. And while here too the divine figures don't have halos, the bright light behind Jesus and all of the spatial depth radiating out from him makes his importance implicit. Once again, we see something of a pyramidal configuration. And this one, there's even a shout out to antiquity. Did you notice the coffered ceiling? In The Last Supper, we see Leonardo's penchant for mathematical balance and symmetrical design, too. Take a look. How many windows are in the back of the room? Yep, there are three. And how many portals are on either side of the room? Uh-huh, there are four on each side. Now, look at the apostles. They're actually in small groupings. How many groups are there? And how many apostles are in each group? That's right, there are four groups of apostles, and there are three apostles in each group. See how he's playing with numbers and balance? It's pretty clever. Over the years, this work has crumbled, been vandalized, been bombed, and restored, and today we're probably looking at very little of the original. See, Leonardo used an experimental technique when painting this one, and the experiment didn't go so well. The painting started falling apart almost immediately, and very little of the original paint and design remain. What we see today is mostly the effort of restorers to recapture Leonardo's intentions. Nonetheless, there are Renaissance and Leonardo characteristics that speak to his mastery and the ethos of the era, and he continued to work and to create into the high Renaissance. And then there's Michelangelo. As I mentioned, he got his start in Florence, and he became more popular and more famous in the 16th century. But his David is one that might still technically count as early Renaissance. Once again, the theme is religious, and once again, there are classical elements of contraposto and attention to ideal anatomy. But how is this David different than Donatello's? Do you notice his face? He's no longer coyly standing atop a defeated giant. Instead, here, he's preparing for battle, slingshot in hand, brow furrowed, gaze focused. This is indicative of Michelangelo's intensity as opposed to Donatello's frivolity, for sure. Plus, this guy is buff. He's muscular without being unrealistic. And if we look closely, we can see some of that linear grace in the details, too. Somehow, Michelangelo is able to convey a softness in the lines and curves of a hand, and all of this is done by chiseling and polishing marble. A 26-year-old Michelangelo carved this statue from a piece of flawed marble. Originally, it was meant for the exterior of the cathedral, but the planning committee was so moved by the work that they decided to place it in the middle of the Piazza Vecchio instead. It suffered some damage there, and they eventually moved it inside, but when you go to Florence, you can still see the original at the Accademia, and you can also see a replica of the statue in the piazza where the original once stood. Oh, and since it was supposed to be stationed high up on the roofline, the David's hands and head are a little larger than they ought to be. Making them larger would also make them easier to see from the ground. Interestingly, though, their emphasis is also kind of symbolic of the era, as David seems especially gifted to think and to create, too. 
And that, folks, is a little bit about the early Renaissance, the era that told the world that humanity, that the individual could achieve great things again. For some, this time marks the point at which we lost our way, when we started to focus too much on ourselves and not enough on God or purpose beyond our own achievements. And for others, this is the time when we as humans remembered that we should embrace our abilities. We should push ourselves to see what we're capable of. And we should celebrate all that we are and all that we can do. Until we meet again.